session is about uh, text on ciphers. We have three exciting uh, talks. Um, the first one is message recovery attacks on Feistel Bates format preserving encryption. Uh, Mia Bellara, Vietong Huang, and Stefano Tesaro, and Stefano is giving the talk. All right, so thank you. So I'm going to talk uh, about our work on attacks on uh, format preserving encryption, and this is joint work with me here, and Vietong Huang, and I'm Stefano Tesaro from UC Santa Barbara. So you're probably all familiar with the concept of a block cipher, like AES, which is an algorithm that encrypts plain text blocks of a certain fixed length, say 128 bits, into ciphertext blocks of the same length using a secret key. Now, one issue that you sometimes encounter with block ciphers is that even though they are very important primitives that are used everywhere in cryptography, they're somewhat rigid in that their domain is fixed to 128 bits, for example. And so a more flexible primitive that has been proposed uh, by many authors over the time in different contexts is that of format-preserving encryption. So roughly a format-preserving encryption scheme can be thought as a block cipher that, however, has plain text as ciphertext belonging to a certain general domain D that could be a bunch of different things depending on the context. For example, you might have a format, an FPE scheme that encrypts plain text that consists of valid credit card numbers and the resulting ciphertexts are, again, valid credit card numbers. And again, the encryption happens with help of a secret key and additionally a tweak, often, that might help you achieve more variance in the ciphertext space. And of course, credit cards are only one example. You might have other things like social security numbers, uh, pin codes, bank account numbers, or special domains like integers, model, or prime, and so on. Now, a typical application scenario for format preserving encryption in that of adding encryption in legacy databases where you have fields whose format is enforced already and cannot be changed. For example, a company might have several tables in a database that contain credit card informations, uh, and they're associated, for example, to customers and to transactions, and they would like to encrypt this without changing the constraints that these entries are valid credit card numbers. And so formal preserving encryption could be used to encrypt these credit card numbers under a certain secret key. And additionally, you can see the importance of tweaks. Different tables could be encrypted under different tweaks so that, in particular, if you have tables containing the same credit card numbers, once you encrypt them under the same key but different tweaks, you're going to obtain different ciphertext. And this should make the job of the attacker uh, somewhat easier. Uh, this is particularly important because one technical challenge that you encounter with formal preserving encryption is that the domains that you want to consider are potentially small, especially when compared with the traditional domain of a block cipher, which is 2 to the 128 uh, elements, for example. So say you have roughly 2 to the 50 valid credit card numbers with a valid checksum, uh, you have even much less social security numbers, and you even want to apply this, and it is applied, FPE is applied to smaller domains like PIN numbers, or uh, you might have only partially encrypted SSN numbers or credit card numbers, making the domain even smaller. And this fact has, has made building FPE schemes in practice very, very, very hard. Um, and in particular, uh, an FPE scheme construction usually is meant to be a mode of operation of a standard block cipher like AES that, however, becomes capable of encrypting over arbitrary domains and preserving the format. And we have seen a few constructions uh, that achieve this. And what has become clear uh, more and more is that there is a clear divide between those constructions that are provably secure and those constructions that are actually practical and practitioners would like to use. And in particular, there have been three constructions that I call here FF1, FF2, and FF3 that have been proposed by different authors that have also been submitted to NIST for consideration to be included in the standard for formal preserving encryption. And two of them, FF1 and FF3, have effectively made it into the standard. It was just recently uh, uh, published by NIST earlier this year. Now, an important thing about these two constructions that we are going to see later, more specifically in this talk, is that they're both based on the well-known Feistel paradigm, and in particular on unbalanced Feistel networks. And the other important thing that I've already said, but I want to stress again, is that their security is not proved. There's no security proofs, but rather the security is just assessed by cryptanalysis and known attacks. 
So the, the main purpose of our work here has been to continue this investigation of the security of these constructions, and in particular, we have focused on proposing new uh, message recovery attacks that are generic against unbalanced Feistel networks, but have been particular applied to this construction. And we look at these attacks within a new security framework, that definitional framework that allows us to exactly characterize what they achieve. And I guess the important bottom line of this is that when applied concretely to FF1 and FF3, in particular over small domains, uh, the attacks show that uh, the parameters that have been chosen by these constructions are not sufficient to guarantee appropriate security margins. And I want to start talking about the definition of framework because that's going to help us understand uh, what these attacks are about. And concretely, we are going to focus on message recovery attacks that are non-adaptive. So this is a very weak form of attack. We might want security against broader attacks from our scheme, but since we do target attacks, the weaker the model is, the stronger our result is. And an example of such an attack is a known plaintext attack, the classical pl known plaintext attack, where a bunch of messages x1 to xq plus a target message x star are encrypted under the same key and the same tweak for now, and the adversary learns all of the highlighted values, so learns everything, both the plaintext and the encryption, except for the target uh, uh, plaintext x star. And the goal is, of course, to find uh, uh, x star, so that's a typo, uh, given all of this information. Now, so note, just to understand what we want to have, that the fact that the domain is small already might potentially allow the adversary to guess the message x star with some good uh, probability. So by learning just plain text ciphertext examples. So for example, here in this context, an adversary knows already that m star is not one of m1 to mq, so it could guess with probability roughly one over the domain size minus the number of examples q, uh, what is the value of the message. And this is of course an optimal strategy if the message x star is uniformly distributed over uh, all of the remaining messages are not x1 to xq. So this might suggest, in fact, that the best that we can hope for in this context of a known plaintext attack is to uh, be only able to, be, uh, to learn uh, at most domain size many messages, otherwise uh, there's nothing left to guess. But this is actually not true if we move to the multi-tweak scenarios, okay? And this is an important point here uh, to appreciate. So imagine, for example, that we are in a setting where you're given a bunch of encryptions of the same pair of messages x and x star, but under q different tweaks, t1 to tq, okay? It's the same pair all over, the same key, but different tweaks. Then the best thing you can naively do, unless you exploit a weakness of the underlying scheme, something you can learn from the actual ciphertext, uh, it's not much. You're really just learning from what you learn here. You learn x, you don't know x star. All you know is that the message x star is different from x, if I give you that guarantee. So despite you having a lot of information under different tweaks, ideally if the scheme, if the scheme is secure, you should not be able to guess x star with probability better than one over the domain size minus one, okay? And this is really independent of the number of tweaks. So what we are expecting from a good FPE scheme in the context of message recovery is that there might be some unavoidable probability that an attacker might guess the message given some side information that he learns, but we would like that the attacker should not be able to do much better once he learns the actual ciphertext and the actual encryptions of the message. And that's exactly what we are going to formalize. And in particular, our framework parameterizes attacks through the notion of a sampler. A sampler is just an algorithm that outputs some values and in particular, it's going to output first a list of examples that consist, consist of pairs of tweaks and uh, plain text to be encrypted, say Q of them for a certain Q, and then it also outputs a target message X star plus some auxiliary information A. And all of these can be arbitrarily correlated, okay? Different samplers, different attacks, okay? We are not imposing any restrictions on these distributions. And now we could start by looking at what is you know, the unavoidable guessing probability that an adversary might have, regardless of the scheme. Uh, and we do this by considering a message guessing game where we sample the outputs of the sampler and we consider an adversary S that now is given the tweaks that come out of the sampler, the auxiliary information, but doesn't learn anything else. It doesn't learn encryption of the messages x1 to xq, nor the messages, nothing more. 
and then attempts to guess the target message x star by outputting a guess x prime, and we look at the probability that it succeeds. Okay? And now we define what we call the message guessing advantage simply as the best guessing probability that an adversary can achieve in such a game. Okay? So this is the best that an adversary can do given just the side information and the values of the tweak and nothing else. And then we want to compare this to the actual attack, where now the adversary is going to additionally learn the encryptions under the considered FPE scheme of the actual plaintext XI under the corresponding tweak and a secret key. And the attacker now is given the encryptions as well as the tweaks plus the auxiliary information, and now attempts to guess the target message by outputting a guess X prime. And now the advantage of the adversary is simply the difference of the probability that he succeeds in this game minus what he could have done before, namely the message guessing advantage, without knowing anything about the encryptions of these messages. Okay? So now a property that we want to expect from a good FPE scheme is that with respect to this class of attacks and with respect to any sampler that outputs a feasible number of sampler, samples and any adversary that runs within feasible running time, it should be that the message recovering advantage that I just defined for this sampler and for this adversary against the FPE scheme should be roughly zero. Okay? So we don't want the adversary to do much better by seeing the ciphertext than what he could do without seeing them. Okay? And feasible for cryptographers in this context is something like, I think, two to the hundred or even higher. That's the kind of values we're targeting here. And what I'm going to show next is that in the context of Feistel networks, Actually, we're not going to be able to achieve this, in particular if we instantiate them with the parameters that have been used in the constructions that appear in the NIST standard. So we are going to concretely show a sampler XS and an adversary which achieve message recovery advantage, which is roughly one. Okay, so to get there, I need to be a little bit more specific about Feistel networks, and I want to talk a little bit more about the construction. So we're going to consider an abstract version of Feistel networks that operate over a domain that we think of as being the product of ZM and ZN. So meaning elements in the domain that we are considering now are pairs of integers L and R. We refer to L as the left segment, R as the right segment, and L is a number between 0 and n minus 1, and R is a number between 0 and n minus 1. Okay? And we are also going to think of having some operation, what I'm going to call plus in this uh, talk, uh, with a corresponding inverse minus that we can define on ZM and ZN. Okay? If it just confuses you, think of this as addition model of M and N, but this can also cover more generic things as long as this operation is an abelian group, and this allows us to capture a number of different instantiation of this construction at the more generic level. And note that for the concrete instantiation of what we are going to see, like in FF1 and FF3, M and N can be relatively small. So the only constraints we get from the standard is that M times N, which is the domain size, is at least 100. Think of this like orders of magnitude in the extreme. So now what is the actual construction? So we are going to consider an unbalanced version of Feistel networks that alternates uh, calling a round function, applying it either to the right segment of the state or to the left segment of the state uh, in an alternating way where the initial state is the input, okay? Uh, the L0 and R0 state, okay? And these round functions are going to take as an input, of course, the secret key and the tweak. So there is an example with three rounds, and the way that then this construction will be instantiated is by actually building this round function from concrete cryptographic primitives like AES or something that is a good pseudo-random function. And in fact, the FF1 and FF3 construction that appear in the standard are just instantiation of these paradigms where concrete construction of the round functions, and FF1 uses 10 rounds, and FF3 uses eight rounds. And for the purpose of this talk, and really you can abstract this away by thinking simply of these uh, round functions as being truly random functions that are applied to the tweak and to whatever input you feed to them, just forget about the secret keys, okay? Okay, so there's been some prior work on attacking Feistel networks uh, in the literature, but most of them is not so relevant for the type of attacks that a uh, practitioner will consider effective. So in particular, there has been some work by Pataran that started already in the early 90s that gave some distinguishing attacks showing that the output of Feistel networks have certain biases. And uh, also a work by Bellar et al. that gave foundations for uh, former preserving encryption consider message recovery attacks or partial message recovery attacks 
but uh, these attacks were succeeding only with a very, very, uh, with a potentially tiny um, advantage. So in this work, we, we give new attacks that are either partial message recovery or full recovery, message recovery attacks uh, that succeed with a very high advantage. And the difference in contrast to this previous work is that our attack will require seeing a lot of examples, uh, but this number of examples is not really high for the parameters that we consider in the context of formal preserving encryptions. So if you have a small domain and uh, a, a, a lone, the number of rounds being either eight or 10, then these attacks become feasible. And I'm going to focus now on the first one because that's the one that is gonna give you the intuition of, of how these attacks work. So the, the ideas behind our attack are, is that they rely on the notion of uh, unwanted biases in Feistel networks that were already observed in special cases by, uh, Pat in Paterand's work. So in particular, the question we are going to ask now is assume you are in the following situation. You're encrypting through such a Feistel network two different inputs, and these inputs sh share the right segment, but they're different on the left segment. So I'm gonna obtain two resulting ciphertext, and I want to know, I want to look at the distribution of LR minus LR prime. So I'm gonna take the left segment of the first ciphertext and subtract to it the left segment of the other ciphertext and see how is it distributed under the assumption that the round functions are random. So it turns out that what we're going to show is that the distribution is very peculiar in that all of the values are going to be slightly, so, so more or less close to uniform or a bit less likely, but one value will tend to appear more often than others, and namely, the difference of LR and LR minus prime is going to tend to be equal to the difference of L0 and L0 prime, okay? The difference of the left segments of the actual inputs. And I can give you some intuition about this. So this statement is obvious if you only consider one round, or in fact, two rounds. Like if you have two such inputs with equal right segment to different left segments, then clearly you're going to have the, the different, so if you have one round, the difference of the left segments of the outputs is going to be equal to the difference of the left segments of the input. This is simply because the one in the one round, the round function, the first round function is going to be applied to the same input, okay? So things are going to cancel out, okay? This is also true for two rounds because really nothing happens to the left segment because we are alternating if we have two rounds. But things become, become a little bit more insightful starting from three rounds, where here, uh, what we can see is that we can write the difference of the left segments of the output now simply as the difference of the left segment of the inputs plus the difference of the outputs of the final call to the round function. And this is just some simple manipulation, but this allows us to see something important, namely that we can distinguish between the situation, the one case, where the two inputs to so the final run function are equal, which happens with probability one over n. In this case, the values are going to be canceled out, the second term, and effectively the difference of the left segments of the output is going to equal the difference of the left segment of the input. However, if this event doesn't happen with probability one minus one over n, then we are gonna evaluate this final uh, round functions on the different inputs, so the difference is going to be uniform, so, so it's going to be the difference of the left segments of the output. Which means if you put everything together that your final distribution is going to look exactly something like this. Because of this probability that you evaluate the final round function on the same input, you're gonna have a peak of the value L0 minus L0 prime as being more likely. And in fact, we generalize this, proving it to arbitrary rounds, and showing that as rounds proceed, there is always a small left hour bias which is going to make this value appearing more likely. This bias is going to vanish with an increasing round number, but again, if the number of rounds is not too high, this is going to still be substantial. And we embed this idea in our first attack, which essentially is going to consider a sampler, the samples to input x and uh, x star, which have the, the same right segment and different uh, left segment. And the attacker, uh, so, and these are going to be encrypted under some tweaks with arbitrary distribution. We also don't make any assumption on the distribution of uh, the non-target input X. All we know is that the left segment of the target uh, message is going to be uniform, different from L0 prime. And then the attacker uh, find itself in, the, in exactly the situation where he knows the highlighted value. So he knows everything which is highlighted and the, go the goal is to complete uh, the input L0, R0, so it needs to uh, guess the value L0 given all of the rest. 
And it is clear that in this setting, the message guessing advantage is going to be at most one over m minus one, because really all that the adversary learns is that this left half L0 is different from L0 prime and nothing more. So it is still m minus one possible options. And you can guess the right one at most probability one over m minus one due to the, due the decision to the fact that this uh, L0 is uniform. However, once we're given the actual ciphertext, we can exploit these biases that we developed before uh, to do something and to actually learn L0 more effectively. In particular, what the attacker can do, he can look at all of the ciphertext, and then for each one of them, he can look at the difference of the left segments of the ciphertext for each pair, and then add it to the value L0 prime that he knows, and we know by before, what we've seen before, that this is going to be more likely to be L0 than anything else. So if you do it often enough, so you get a lot of candidate values and you expect L0 to appear more often than any other value. And so if you pick that particular value and the number of examples is high enough, then uh, with overwhelming probability, you're going to get, recover L0. Okay, and we put this formula in a theorem where we give an exact expression of how many examples you need. I'm not gonna go into this and I'm gonna show you some, some evaluation and concrete numbers later on, okay? So we have two other attacks that I am not going to go into details. Uh, there's more on the slides than what I want to say. Um, so it's, one is a dual of these attacks, and actually that's one of the most important technical parts of this work. And we are going to be able to use this to combine it with our, the attack I just explained to actually obtain an attack which is a full message recovery attack in a setting where we have three messages that are encrypted over and over with a large number of tweaks and one of these three messages is completely unknown, and we are going to be able to recover this message. So I want to show you to conclude some numbers of the attacks for the concrete case of FF1 and FF3 that are proposing the standards. And remember that our goal will be that for these particular samplers and attackers that we give in the paper, the message recovering advantage is small and is zero, up to a very large number of samples. But that's exactly what doesn't happen. So for example, if we look at um, FF3, so this is a construction that uses eight rounds, then we see that already after roughly two to the 25 samples, if the domain is very small, say eight bits, which is valid in the standard, we already, our attacker already achieves advantage one. And even if we make the domains bigger, say we go up to 12 bits, still up to starting from two to the 35 samples, which is much smaller than the two to 100 or more we would like to have with the advantage becomes one. Things become a little bit better with 10 rounds for FF1, but not significantly better. You still get way, way much less than what you would like to have. And this is our, the attack I explained before, where we only recover left, the left half of the message for the full message recovery attack that I haven't explained. Uh, again, things are slightly more secure. Uh, the goal is a bit harder to achieve, but still we get numbers that uh, show significant insecurity, okay? starting from two to the 37 or so on for small domains uh, from that number of samples, uh, we, the, the advantage becomes already close to one. So to conclude, um, so what we show really here is at the higher level we show generic attacks against unbalanced Feistel networks uh, and we analyze them in framework that which we believe even theoretically to be of independent interest, but I guess the most important message here is the application to the actual construction in the standard where we show that essentially for the choice of parameters, uh, in particular eight and 10 rounds, on small domains, this construction become completely insecure against the type of attacks that we propose here. And in particular, what we suggest that should be done at the very least is to increase the round numbers, at least for small domain, to mitigate these, effect, these attacks. Of course, the attacks are not, uh, are, they show some concerns. They are perhaps not the most realistic attack scenario that you can mount in practice, but uh, I wouldn't feel confident now keeping this uh, number of rounds. And we disclosed the attacks to NIST, um, and uh, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. And the paper is on ePrint with more details. Thank you very much. So questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. Can you pop back to the slide with the table of the old attacks and the new attacks? Right. Uh, <clears throat> let me go back. Yeah. Yep, there it went. Uh, too fast. Yeah. Right. So what's going on with the minus in the ex 
component there. Isn't that a tiny, tiny? That's a typo. Yeah, yeah, that's a typo. Oh, it's a typo. Yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. Good, thank you. Yeah, I had a probability before, and then I just, yeah, so, yeah. Stefano, thanks yeah. for the great talk. Yeah. Is there any reason at all that you didn't mention differential cryptanalysis at any point in your talk? I mean, uh, that's essentially what you're doing, right? You're looking at input differences, you're looking at output differences, you're using that to recover uh, something in the last round. I mean, this is classical <laughs> differential cryptanalysis of an arithmetic. Uh, sure, sure, an sure, right? sure. But I guess, you know, it, it differs, yeah, I, I mean, yes. But uh, I think okay. there is this idea of, you know, that maybe of having multiple tweaks and the simplification yeah, yeah. of confidence, which I think, is, yeah, so definitely, you know, the fact of seeing a bias there, you can think of this like that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Other questions? So I have one question. So yeah. is NIST going to do something about this? So are there plans to... Uh, you have to ask NIST uh, if what, yeah. they, what they want to do. So, I mean, uh, so to be fair, I have to, I have to say that the actual, oops, the actual proposals that were submitted, or at least as far as I know, at least one of them, which is a FFX that has become an FF1. So it was actually suggesting different parameters for the round number. So I think it was NIST's decision to fix it to uh, 10 in that particular case. So something that you could do, so you could either increase the round number, so we give some suggestion in the paper, uh, if you want to have a fixed round numbers. But really what's happening here is that somehow the, the message length is becoming part of the security parameter. So, and it's kind of unavoidable in, in Faisal. So, the, you know, the longer the message is, the more secure the thing should be. So you should compensate that with rounds. So something that you could do is add more rounds for shorter messages. That might be very hard to handle in practice because you will actually have one algorithm with a fixed number of rounds. And, but it will not be necessary to increase the round number potentially for what we know right now for, for messages. But that would be the obvious fix, okay? But what, what needs to really want to do, I don't know. So far, we just got to thank you uh, back, so. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. So...